Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome to another edition of this scope here on British Muslim TV and Ramadan Kareem to all of our viewers who are fasting right now as we speak. Um, we're going to be discussing Yemen today, as many of you know, who've been following us on social media. Of course, this is being broadcast live, not only on satellite, but throughout BMTV's various social media channels as well. And discussing Yemen, we're going to discuss the truce that has just been brought into place in that country. It's a two-month truce that has been brokered by the United Nations between the Saudi-led coalition, as well as the Houthis or Ansarullah, depending on which name you want to give them. Now, GCC peace talks have been held. Um, they haven't gotten very far because the Houthis decided not to attend those talks, considering they were held in Saudi Arabia itself, and the Houthis had demanded a neutral territory for those talks to take place in. Therefore, those have not moved forward much. However, the Saudis insist that those talks as well are not meant to replace the UN peace process itself, and that that remains, even in the Saudis' eyes, the main priority at this point in time in resolving the situation in Yemen. Now, under this truce that we are currently in the midst of, warring sides have accepted to halt all offensive military operations in the country, as well as across its borders. They've also agreed for fuel ships to enter into the ports in the Hodeida region. That's extremely important, especially during the fasting month of Ramadan, and as, as well for commercial flights to operate from the airport in the capital, Sana'a, to predetermined destinations in the region as well. There's a lot to discuss, certainly, when it comes to this issue. Um, we're joined by two esteemed panelists. We're joined by Dr. Alexandra Stark, who is a senior researcher for the Political Reform Program at the New America Foundation. She has expertise in US foreign policy, international security, as well as Middle East politics. And she's also currently writing a book about US policies, as well as the war in Yemen. And we're also joined by Abdul Ghani al iriani who is a senior researcher at the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies, where he focuses on the Yemeni peace process, conflict analysis, as well as transformations of the Yemeni state. He has worked in the past with the United Nations, as well as the World Bank, on issues related to the conflict in Yemen. Abdul Ghani and Alexandra, thank you both for joining us today here on BMTV. And I'm just wondering if I may start with you, Alexandra, first. Um, what are your thoughts about the truce that has been brought into place right now? I think the most important thing here is that the truce uh, is hopefully a reprieve for the Yemeni people and uh, hopefully not a temporary one either. This is the first major nationwide ceasefire that we've seen in Yemen since 2016. Um, as you mentioned, this war has already killed almost 400,000 people in Yemen, directly and indirectly. About 70% of those killed have been children. And the UN and relief organizations estimate that about 80% of the population is in need of some kind of humanitarian assistance. Um, I know that officials I've spoken to are also hopeful that this truce will provide the space for parties to agree to a longer term framework for peace negotiations. And, and hopefully that could even lead to a sustainable peace. Um, that's a much bigger lift because there are a lot more uh, questions that would need to be answered and addressed, um, compromises. But I think this could be a really important, hopefully, uh, inshallah, first step in that direction. Abdul Ghani, what are your thoughts about this? Because, you know, we have had previous ceasefires, but they've been violated. Even this time around, there are already accusations on both sides about violations. There are even some reports that I read online about even the port of Hodeida and access there being fairly limited, in fact, even for fuel ships. Well, this is different from uh, previous ceasefires in that uh, I think it came at the time when the Houthis have... Uh, been unable to make any further advances towards the city of Marib. They have reached the limit of what they can achieve by military force. So naturally, they, they are more inclined to negotiate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the other side, uh, the Saudi-led coalition, uh, have, uh, for the first time in uh, five years, allowed uh, Sana'a Airport to receive commercial flights. That's a big uh, development. And uh, maybe, uh, I think, it, it, there are signs that both sides are uh, ready for a conclusion to this very unfortunate conflict. Uh, there seems to be some kind of uh, secret negotiations between the Houthis and the Saudis, and that might produce uh, more, uh, more, uh, let's say, a greater uh, break in this conflict. 
Alexandra, you know, interestingly, the Iranians too are happy this time around with the ceasefire. They've said that they support a ceasefire, that they support a process, an intra-Yemeni dialogue, as they have uh, called for for many, many years. Can we actually reach a point, do you think, of intra-Yemeni dialogues? Because, you know, the Saudis called what happened in Saudi Arabia intra-Yemeni, but it wasn't really, was it? No, I, I think uh, or, or hope that this uh, truce could open space for, uh, for a true inter-Yemeni dialogue. Um, as you said, the Houthis are not in, were invited, but are not attending the uh, GCC-led talks. I think those talks could still be constructive in the sense that there are also deep divisions within the anti-Houthi uh, coalition. And so we've seen uh, some evidence that, that leaders of those different factions are talking to one another, um, and that could kind of build towards broader, broader political negotiations. And, you know, Abdul Ghani, another issue that, that, that comes up often is about the Houthis and their place at the table. Um, the, you know, there, there's obviously accusations both ways about war crimes, et cetera. But should the Houthis have an equal place at the table? Definitely. The Houthis are in control of the, of the capital of the Yemeni state. They're in control of the institutions of the Yemeni state, including its army. They're in control uh, of area that is inhabited by over 60% of the population. If they are not uh, sitting at the table, then there is no negotiation. And so with the Houthis, if they do come at the table, then Alexander, we just have about two minutes. Um, do you think that we can actually genuinely have, for example, Abdur Abu Mansur Hadi sitting across the table from one of the Houthi leaders? I mean, is that genuinely a possibility which we can see happening right now? Uh, I hope so. I think I think that's a, a rather optimistic uh, prediction. We might see more indirect conversations as well as as Abdul Ghani indicated were uh, we think already happening behind the scenes. Hmm. And so Abdul Ghani, if we talk about those behind the scenes conversations, then uh, what do you think those are like at this point in time to convince the Houthis to then come to the table? They were not convinced this time around. Will the Saudis then agree to the Houthi demand of a neutral territory? Uh, well, it's not just the neutral territory. Uh, the Houthis have, uh, have the standard position of the Houthis is not to negotiate with the clients of Saudi Arabia. Uh, they want to negotiate only with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, their uh, advances in the, in the, um, uh, the military uh, front uh, has made it possible for them to uh, stick to that position. Hopefully, uh, right now, as they uh, change their position uh, and as they come to some agreement with Saudi Arabia, they will be willing to talk to their Yemeni brothers. Okay, just in under 30 seconds, if you, if you can, Alexandra, um, before we go into, into a, a long break, I'm, I'm wondering what, who then answers for the crimes committed by both sides? I know this is a very heavy duty question, and we're gonna discuss that in greater detail, but do you think that there is a process in place for that to also occur whenever there is then a peace process? Well, there ought to be. I think accountability is really essential to uh, finding a sustainable solution for this conflict. And, and we've seen in the past how a lack of accountability for different actors can um, help conflicts or, or kind of push conflicts to resume. So unfortunately, the UN um, Human Rights Council ended, voted to end a uh, mechanism of experts who were uh, tracking the conflict and pointing to human rights violations in uh, late 2021. I would hope to see, and we've seen calls from, from many groups to see more accountability um, at the international level. Okay, viewers, we're just about to go into a, a, a break for the call to prayer. Um, we will, of course, be back, though, with Alexandra and Abdul Ghani, and we're going to discuss, as I put to Alexandra as well, accountability in greater detail, because that's something that people on both sides have been calling for, and there's been blame on both sides as well about war crimes, about the humanitarian situation in the country, those harrowing images of Yemeni children that come out uh, of that country as well, especially as the month of Ramadan has also begun and, and prices have gone up there, fuel, et cetera. Also, we're gonna discuss all of that after this call to prayer break. Uh, stay with us, please, for, for that um, right after this break.
Welcome back everyone here on Scope, here on BMTV. We're continuing our discussion today about the situation and the war in Yemen. And we're, we're still joined by Alexandra Stark and Abdul Ghani Al Iryani. Now, Abdul Ghani, before going to the break, I'd put to Alexandra about accountability. And there's a lot to be said there, right? Um, there are a lot of reports about how the Saudi-led coalition, for example, has targeted hospitals, um, schools, et cetera. And certainly there are a lot of reports about the Houthis and the activities and, and attacks that they have carried out as well. Um, do you think it is practically, is, is it realistic, in fact, and put it this way, to expect that there will be accountability in those regards? I'm afraid the internationally recognized government uh, has undermined the chances of international uh, accountability by uh, appointing a Yemeni uh, committee for human rights, which of course uh, represents only one side, although there are some very good people working in the committee, but uh, it doesn't have the credibility. Uh, and uh, on the Houthi side, uh, they have a similar uh, outfit, and neither of them have the credibility. The international community uh, should help the Yemenis uh, uh, bring uh, those guilty to account. But before that, we have to work on ending the war. And uh, then I think the Yemenis will be able to pursue the, the accountability of the war criminals uh, after, the, after, after the war is ended. Alexandra, as a, as a side note, I wanted to ask about what you think of the U.S. role presently in Yemen, right? Because there's a lot being that's said about the U.S. support of the Saudis vis-a-vis uh, -vis arms, and that still continues, certainly, um, in general. But even when it came to Yemen, there was a lot of talk about intelligence support on the, bar, on the part of the West, and I know that's a macro term I'm using here, but there was a lot of intelligence sharing. Um, do you think that that has changed to have some dynamics changed behind the scenes that may have pushed, for example, the Saudi side at least to go into these, this peace process in this specific tr this truce and the ceasefire? Yeah, I think that I think that's correct. Um, I, I think that American analysts sometimes tend to overemphasize the role of the United States in, in various international issues. And sometimes there's this assumption that you know, the outcome depends in one way or another on what the United States does. Um, and that's not entirely true in this case. The, the truce itself is, is a reflection of uh, the dynamics of the conflict on the ground, uh, of uh, regional actors, uh, uh, of a number of different factors, not just U.S. policy. Um, but that being said, I do think that the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, where the Biden administration um, centered diplomacy in, in their policy and, and made ending the war a priority, um, and also continue to limit U.S. support to the Saudi-led coalition, although, as you mentioned, of course, they are still providing support, including uh, you know, maintenance and, and, and parts for um, the coalition's um, uh, air campaign, for example. Um, so, so I think that that uh, investment in diplomacy did help to revive the UN-led process and the fact that um, Special Envoy Timothy Lenderking and the, the Biden administration more broadly has really backed that process and said, we're going to put our, our, our weight and our emphasis behind, behind the UN-led process. Uh, I think that's, that's really important and has contributed, um, among other factors, to what we're seeing today. So, um, Abdul Ghani, uh, for, uh, from your vantage point, why now all these years into this war, why now have this truce? Why now have this positive movement? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm just saying that why has it taken all these years to reach this point, in your opinion? Is it, for example, on the Houthi side, the Iranians possibly also pressuring them and saying, listen, enough is enough? Uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's the case exactly uh, of course the fear on the houthi side that an agreement on jcpoa between iran and, uh, and the us will also include limiting the supply of weapons to the houthis so they need to uh, uh, finish this war before they uh, lose that uh, source of uh, supply but also i think that uh, the us pressure on saudi arabia uh, has been very important very significant and bringing the Saudis also to closer to a, a peace agreement. And uh, I think that the, the, the situation 
could not continue as it is now. In the, in the Saudi side, they're losing badly, and uh, they need to extricate themselves out of this conflict. And the Houthi side, while they are winning at the battle at the battlefield, the economy is in shatters, and uh, they they know that uh, one day there will be an explosion uh, against them, and they will lose everything. You know, Alexandra, um, if, if I may use this term, it, do you think it is embarrassing almost for the Saudis to be in this in this position seven years into this war, considering they have overwhelming arms, ammunition, power versus anything that the Houthis would have had, especially the beginning of this war? And certainly we can debate whether or not the Iranians have been able to properly physically actually provide them weapons. I mean, I'm sure that that has happened at some level, but maybe not to the extent certainly of the U.S. supplying the Saudis with weapons. Well, I think it's not necessarily surprising that um, an intervention that Saudi officials hoped would last up to maybe six weeks at, at the beginning, um, that was in March 2015, has lasted uh, over seven years now. Um, and, and as you said, despite the, the military capabilities that Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE and other members of the coalition possess, they haven't been particularly successful on the, the battlefield. Um, I don't think that's particularly surprising. And I think um, I, I think the move to try to, to end the intervention uh, by the Saudi-led coalition is, is really important. I hope that Saudi Arabia and Emirati uh, the UAE see it that way as well. I, I think Abdul Ghani is right that there has been an increasing recognition over the years that um, the coalition won't be able to win the war on behalf of the, the government of Yemen, the internationally recognized government, and that there's really no military solution for this conflict. So I, I hope that this truce is a further sign of, of that recognition. And, you know, Abdul Ghani, another narrative and another dynamic that has played out throughout these years is also the disagreements between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, uh, specific, specifically in different parts of Yemen, right, and how that has played out sometimes on the ground with the reports that have come out. Um, can those two countries look beyond their differences when it comes to Yemen and do what is best for, for Yemenis? Uh, I'm hoping that will be the case, although it doesn't uh, appear... Uh so clear cut. Uh, the Emiratis have actually won against the, uh, the Saudis in, in their intervention in the Yemen conflict. They have achieved their objectives, while the Saudis haven't. Uh, so uh, I think the Emiratis will be willing to support any Saudi solution of the conflict in Yemen, because uh, that that is the most preferred outcome for the Emiratis. Um, Alexandra, I wanted to bring you in and ask you about Iran as well, right? Because that's, Iran is a huge player here, at least in accusations of how much they support the Houthis. In your opinion, how much support is there really there? I mean, you know, the Iranians would argue there's been a blockade from almost day one, right? And so how on earth would we be able to, if I'm, if I'm parroting an Iranian official for a moment and playing devil's advocate, how on earth would we be able to physically get those sorts of supplies to the Houthis. Um, so they would argue that sense that, sure, moral support is there, diplomatic support, all of the above, but we haven't been able to physically supply these arms to the Houthis. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, we certainly have evidence um, that Iran has provided direct support to, to the Houthis and that that support has escalated over the years of the conflict. Um, that in terms of, of kind of blocking off, off ports and airports, we there's some evidence that they've been able to use smuggling routes by sea or over the border from Oman. Um, so it's not impossible. And, and in the meantime, we've seen, for example, an escalation over the past uh, couple of years in the Houthis' use of um, ballistic missiles and, and drone technology uh, that the UN panel of experts has traced directly to Iranian technology. And has so we know that um, the Houthis are able to at least import that technology import pieces that they can then assemble um, in Yemen. So certainly that support is there. I think an interesting thing to note is that that support has escalated significantly. So I think at the beginning of the conflict, there, the, there was less, um, or, or before the conflict started, there was less direct Iranian support. And uh, still uh, to this day, I think um, 
some can tend to kind of overemphasize how much control Iran has over the Houthis. It's not as though the Houthis are direct proxies for Iran who are kind of obeying their, their commands. They're uh, closer to a partnership. So um, it's not as though the Houthis are always doing what Iran tells them to do, but there's certainly, certainly a partnership there. Abdulhani, would it then be fair to say that the Houthis have been able to retaliate, I mean, I'm using that word in quotation marks, certainly, on Saudi Arabia and even the UAE in the fashion that they've been able to send those drones over, uh, missiles over their border due to Iranian support? Has that been very vital in that case, do you think? Well, uh, there, is no, there is no doubt that uh, this uh, technology is Iranian, was provided with the support of Iran, even if it comes from third parties. Uh, <clears throat> I think that as the war progressed, uh, uh, Houthi reliance on Iranian support uh, increased, and therefore the link between the two uh, has increased. And uh, we witnessed a big, uh, I think, uh, a big shift in the attack on Aramco uh, two years ago, when, uh, when it was clearly for the benefit of an Iranian agenda and not the Yemeni agenda. But uh, I agree with, uh, with Alexandra that they're not proxies uh, per se, but they're getting closer and closer to Iran. Um, you know, Alexandra, there are also talks happening apparently behind the scenes between the Iranians and the Saudis as well. Do you think that those sorts of dynamics also play out into the situation in Yemen? Yeah, I think if there there is some kind of, uh, as you say, detente um, or easing of, of the tensions between um, the Iranian side and, and, and Saudi Arabia, that could help to uh, ease the tensions of the conflict, maybe help the conflict parties to move closer together. It wouldn't certainly yeah. end war in Yemen. Um, it, it wouldn't wouldn't stop what we're seeing on the ground necessarily, but it would definitely be, uh, I think, helpful in the diplomatic sense. And we may even see some of that wrapped up uh, the dynamics of the Iran deal Very negotiations well. that are going yeah. on. I'll have to cut you off, Alexandra. I do apologize. Time has gotten the best of us. We really appreciate both yourself and Abdul Ghani. Thank you very much for taking your time out today to speak to us. We were discussing their Yemen viewers. Next week, of course, um, the scope will be back. We'll be discussing another hot topic, international affairs. Please do send in your comments as always. Um, and of course, join us next week here at the same time here on BMTV. I've been Thanks very much for watching.